Earth is a standout world and a success story. A thriving oasis among scores of dried up deserts. Scores of dried up deserts. But no matter how well suited we are, our barren companions are a constant reminder that balance simply cannot last forever. Balance simply cannot last forever. Though the sun remains peaceful today, a new age is coming for the solar system. A new age is coming for the solar system. An age of change, destruction and evolution. An age for new worlds and new stories, but one in which the Earth has no place. Earth has no place. A new age is coming for the solar system. 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 As we mentioned last time, the solar system today is around four and a half billion years old. The same age as its centerpiece, the sun. Up until this point in the solar system's life, a great many things have determined its structure and arrangement, particularly the migration of its largest planets and its interactions with neighbouring stars during the early stages of its life. But looking towards the distant future, it is changes within the core of the sun that will ultimately decide the fate of the solar system. The sun is a gigantic, unfathomably powerful nuclear furnace currently crushing hydrogen nuclei within its core and turning them into helium nuclei, in what is known as its main sequence burning phase. The main sequence is the principal stage of a star's life, generating a steady stream of light and heat which has nourished and maintained Earth's delicate natural balance and powered its biosphere for more than 4 billion years. However, though we don't notice it on human timescales, as the sun's main sequence progresses, the share of hydrogen within the core falls and the share of helium increases, thus causing the sun to burn hotter and brighter over time. Every billion years or so, the sun becomes about 10% more luminous and therefore 10% stronger. And while this will lead to catastrophic consequences for the solar system in the long run, it won't be very long at all before things start becoming uncomfortable on the Earth. Around 600 million years from now, the Sun's intensifying emissions will have disrupted the Earth's carbon cycle, unhinging Earth's biosphere and decimating its balance. Trees and other photosynthetic plants which rely on carbon dioxide to produce oxygen will die out, burning up and withering away. As the Sun gets hotter, its habitable zone, the circumstellar region of space where temperate worlds like the Earth can support liquid water on their surfaces, will shift outwards and beyond Earth's orbit. As this happens, our oceans will begin to dry up and boil away, evaporating into a thick, hot atmospheric layer and snuffing out the life that remains within. Molecules of water vapour which rise upwards will be broken down into their constituent hydrogen and oxygen atoms before being irreversibly lost to space. And within a billion years, our once illustrious and beautiful planet will be scorched and bled bone dry, and almost all of its multicellular life will have been eradicated. Around 1.4 billion years from today, the habitable zone of the Sun will extend to encompass the orbit of Mars. As Mars warms up, the frozen CO2 within its polar ice caps will thaw and evaporate, and thicken its atmospheric layer, and the red planet will once again know temperate conditions on its old, dead surface. However, in the absence of a geologically active core to protect this atmosphere from solar wind, Mars will not be able to hold on to this denser CO2 layer long enough to give it a shot at becoming habitable. 
Generally, the prospects of the worlds for the inner solar system are not great. Due to its increased radiance, the Sun will be producing much stronger stellar wind emissions, and this will likely begin to disrupt the orbits of all four of the terrestrial planets as they are pushed off course by radiation. Mercury's orbital eccentricity around the more luminous Sun will increase the most, causing it to veer out of its present day orbit and into a highly elongated orbit which crosses the orbital lines of the other terrestrials. And so one day, Mercury may collide with the Earth or Venus, or perhaps a close encounter will eject this tiny world out from the inner solar system. All of this will happen within about one and a half billion years or so. The Earth will be cooked and its biosphere destroyed, thanks to merely a 15% increase in the Sun's emittance. Not very much, given what comes next in the Sun's life as it continues its relentless march towards the end of its main sequence. Around 3.5 billion years from now, the Earth's temperatures will be similar to Venus's today. Hundreds of degrees with a toxic atmosphere, inhospitable to any kind of life. Around this time, something truly spectacular will happen. Not to the Sun, but to the galaxy. The ultimate light show that will unfortunately fall upon dead eyes will begin. The collision of the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies. Right now, we are millions of light years away from Andromeda, the largest galaxy in the local group, almost twice the size and more than double the star count of the Milky Way. However, with every second that passes, Andromeda is getting around 110 kilometers closer, and in around 4 billion years from now, they will draw so near that the two galaxies will collide head-on, trading and exchanging a combined total of as many as one and a half trillion stars, many of which will have systems of planets like ours. The tidal forces of each galaxy's influence will deform spiral arms into giant star-bursting trails as the two black holes at the centres of each galaxy coalesce. It will take billions more years following the initial encounter for the new galaxy, unoriginally named Milkdromeda, to fully merge into a supergiant elliptical galaxy, but with each iteration stars will be violently flung at one another, inevitably resulting in some collisions. However, given that the space between us and other stars is so much faster than the scale of the Sun, it's highly unlikely that we will be pulled into a system-destroying collision of stars. That being said, around this time, the Sun will also be undergoing its own great cosmic light show, as it begins to exit its main sequence and enter the dying stage of its life. As we mentioned earlier, within the Sun's core, the share of hydrogen is always falling as it is fused into helium, and in about 5 billion years from now, this core hydrogen supply will begin to deplete, and the Sun will briefly stop producing as much outward pressure causing its photosphere to briefly contract. This contraction will compress matter around the core and heat it up, while lugging hydrogen from the outer layers of the Sun into a shell-like structure around the helium centre. Eventually, the core of the Sun will become hot enough to reignite its fusion furnace. Not in its nearly inert helium centre, but within this external hydrogen shell. Only this time, the energy generated by the fusion will be largely absorbed by the Sun's outer layers. And thus, in about 5.4 billion years time, the Sun will start to swell and inflate, ballooning to tens and then hundreds of times its current diameter as it exits its main sequence. It will become significantly more luminous and radiant, but this energy output will be spread over an enormous and ever-increasing surface area, causing the Sun's outer edge to cool to around 2600 Kelvin, about half of what it was during the main sequence, causing it to turn an orangey-red colour. It will have become a red giant. At the peak of this post-main sequence phase, known as the Red Giant Branch, the Sun will have a radius of about 1.2 astronomical units, so about 20% larger than the average orbital distance of the Earth today. 
And so, if we haven't already, by this point, we can say with relative certainty that it is goodbye to Mercury and Venus. Should they have avoided colliding up until now, the two planets will be engulfed and vaporised by the Sun's expanding photosphere. And after this, sadly, Earth will be the next name on the death list. Earth may be engulfed by the expanding Sun like its siblings, or it may just escape the Red Giant's expansion and survive very close to its outer edge. Needless to say that the conditions it would experience would be nothing short of hellish. Scientists aren't really sure what will happen, because even though the Red Giant Sun's radius will eventually exceed our orbital distance today, the harsher and more frequent solar wind emissions will push Earth outwards, perhaps just enough to escape the Sun's gulp. Current estimations lean more towards the Earth being consumed, unfortunately. While it will be pushed outwards by the solar wind, it will also be dragged back due to its gravitational interactions with the Sun's outer layers. And so, it may be the case that Earth is destroyed only half a million years before the Sun reaches the tip of the red giant branch. It is estimated that only objects further away than about 1.15 astronomical units will be able to survive the red giant phase, and so Mars will probably not be consumed but it will eventually follow in the footsteps of its siblings and any brief moment of habitability it may have enjoyed before the Sun's main sequence ended will be over. Just as the Sun's habitable zone will continue to shift with its increased radiance, so too will the snow line of the solar system, another circumstellar region of a specific temperature, beyond which it is cold enough for volatile substances like water and methane to exist as solid ice, which allows for much larger planets, icy moons, and majestic ring systems. Currently, the snow line sits between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, but during the red giant branch, it will shift much further out into space, and the outer solar system will begin to warm. And so, should they still remain, that will mark the end of Saturn's brilliant ring system, as well as any other ring systems that may have been created within this time. When the Sun reaches the tip of the red giant branch, the final age of the solar system will have truly begun. With no habitable terrestrials and only gas giants left, you'd be forgiven for assuming that this would be an age without life. But in reality, this may mark the beginning of a new awakening of life during the solar system's last hurrah. An age not of life on planets, but perhaps one of life on moons. Each of the four gas giants is home to at least a dozen satellites, which range in sizes, but it is the two largest gas giants Saturn and Jupiter, where things really start to get interesting. Jupiter and Saturn both host planet-sized moons larger than Mercury, made of rock, ice, gas and water. But today, they are all frozen solid. However, as the Sun becomes a much more luminous red giant, these volatile rich moons will begin to warm up. Because these moons orbit very close to the huge, vice-like gravitational influences of their gas giant hosts, they are often acted upon and squashed by gravity, creating friction within their interiors which heats up their mantles to the point at which their icy contents can melt into fluid. This creates entire, hidden subsurface oceans of water, which are sealed off and protected from space possibly even with geological activity on the ocean floor. These oceans would most likely provide a similar environment to the one in which life on Earth is thought to have emerged. The only drawback is that any life processes here would not have access to the light and warmth of the Sun, which has proved essential for more complex life on Earth. Of these worlds, it is Europa and Enceladus that we think have the best chance of being habitable in the present day solar system. We have detected evidence of buried, tidally heated subsurface oceans of liquid water on each, 
And so, it may seem that these worlds may be the lifeboats, or arcs, of habitability heading into the new age. But in reality, that is not the case. In the absence of a substantial atmosphere on either of these two moons, once the sun reaches the peak of the red giant branch, their icy surfaces will be heated much too high to preserve the icy crust. Europa in particular, being closer to the red giant's expanded surface, will eventually be heated to hundreds of degrees, melting the icy shield that has protected its oceans and exposing them to the near vacuum of space, claiming anything that may be living inside. While these moons are much further away from the sun, they will still lie well before the vastly extended habitable zone and snow line of the solar system in the new age, and so their surface temperatures will quickly become unsustainable. However, there is one moon in the solar system that is unique, and has a defining characteristic which may help it to escape such a fate, making it by far the best chance for a future awakening of life. Titan. Titan is Saturn's largest moon, and the second largest overall moon in the solar system. It is not quite as big as Jupiter's moon of Ganymede, but it appears so when observed directly due to its standout feature, a massive, thick and dense atmosphere of nitrogen and methane, which extends hundreds of kilometres above the surface of the moon. This is the most dense and rich atmosphere found on any moon in the solar system, in fact, it is the only known moon in the solar system with a dense atmosphere, period. Needless to say, Titan is a special, special world. This atmosphere constitutes a lower layer of nitrogen gas, topped by an upper level of methane which is being broken down by ultraviolet light from the sun, creating a thick, opaque fog which completely conceals the surface. The key advantage of this is that it actually keeps the moon's surface cool. The sun's rays which would otherwise warm the moon don't make it past the methane haze, rendering Titan's surface insensitive to changes in the sun's emittance. Thus, in the distant future, when Enceladus and Europa have had their surfaces melted entirely, Titan's surface won't experience the same kind of unsustainable, inhospitable heating making it the solar system's best shot for a new living world in the far future. And that's not the only thing that this incredible moon has got going for it. In addition to the protective atmosphere, its frozen surface is brimming with organic molecules and compounds which could act as the building blocks for the emergence of new life. For a long time, we didn't know what Titan's surface was like, due to its cloud covering. But then, in 2004, the Cassini-Huygens mission took us there, and we managed to land a probe on the surface, giving us our first glimpse of the complex world which sits below the clouds. What we found was a ready-made, frozen oasis rich in hydrocarbons and cyanides, ingredients for chemistry, but ingredients that lie frozen and dead in the ground. Today, Titan's surface temperature is around minus 177 degrees Celsius. So cold that mountain ranges of solid ice line its landscape, and water ice boulders are scattered across dunes, plains and riverbeds. At this low temperature, these riverbeds do not hold liquid water, but rather liquid methane. On Earth, methane takes the shape of a colourless flammable gas, but on Titan, it is so cold that this volatile gas becomes a liquid, which fills great black rivers, tended to and replenished by methane rain which falls from its skies. Titan's methane cycle is surprisingly similar to the water cycle on Earth, and thus there exists an abundance of streams and channels through which life-giving water could flow were the moon temperate. Titan has the potential to be a blue moon, but one which simply just needs defrosting. And that day is coming. 
the sun is to enter its red giant phase, and when it does, more solar energy will reach Titan and warm it up. As this happens, the solar spectrum will redden, and less ultraviolet radiation will bombard the moon, leading to less broken down methane in the upper atmosphere, which will cause the hazy methane clouds to thin out. The lakes of liquid methane would quickly evaporate, adding a potent greenhouse gas to an already thick and warming atmosphere, further enhancing the greenhouse effect. Titan's water ice mountains will thaw, sending liquid water cascading into the basins left by the methane. Water would be distributed all over the moon within no time, and Titan would become a world that bears striking resemblance to the oasis that we know on Earth today. The problem is, is that even with the haze dispelling, it's unlikely that Titan's surface would warm to the level sufficient to allow oceans of water and carbon dioxide like we have on the Earth. However, that doesn't rule out the possibility of life. The water used in biochemistry simply serves as a solvent, for mixing things and facilitating complex chemical reactions. Thus, life need not be based on carbon, like there is in the Earth's oceans today. Life could hypothetically be based on silicon, and emerge in oceans containing ammonia, another liquid which is commonplace throughout worlds in the cosmos. And it just so happens that ammonia is present on Titan. Like many other moons, Titan is thought to have a subsurface ocean, containing a mixture of water and ammonia and this ammonia is sometimes transported onto the surface thanks to cryovolcanic activity. So, what's the main benefit of all this? Well, unlike the water that lies in Earth's oceans, which freezes at temperatures lower than around 270 Kelvin, water-ammonia mixtures can stay liquid down to a temperature of just 176 Kelvin. Therefore, even if Titan's surface stays relatively cold under the hazy light of the red sun, the temperatures will still more than likely surpass the threshold to support lakes of water and ammonia on Titan's surface, probably for more than half a billion years. That is a longer time frame than it is thought to have taken life on Earth to emerge, but with that said, the presence of ammonia in the water would mean that the chemical reactions necessary for life would probably proceed more slowly. And so, it's still up for debate as to whether Titan would have enough time to have its own awakening of life. However, biosphere or no biosphere, it is Titan that will be sitting pretty at the end of the world. But of course, nothing lasts forever and maybe as soon as the window for life on Titan gets going, it will be snatched away again as the sun undergoes yet more drastic changes. The sun is not large enough to go supernova and explode when it reaches the end of the red giant phase. Supernova explosions require the star in question to fuse heavier and heavier elements at ever-increasing temperatures until iron is produced, and then the star collapses in on itself and explodes. But that requires unfathomably massive stars to achieve the density and temperatures needed to go supernova. Alas, the Sun is not massive enough to fuse anything much beyond the fusion of helium into carbon, and so, instead of blowing up, it will fluctuate in size and luminosity before eventually falling apart. During the red giant phase, the hydrogen burning shell around the Sun's core will gradually increase the total mass of said core until it accounts for about half of the Sun's remaining mass a third of which will have been lost as solar wind during the red giant stage. Within this concentrated core, the pressure will eventually become so great that it is sufficient to start fusing the nearly all helium core into carbon. Around 7 billion years from now, this will lead to what is known as a helium flash, a very rapid runaway nuclear process where helium is converted into carbon through the triple alpha process creating an extreme but brief event. 
After this happens, the sun will not be able to fuse this leftover carbon into heavier elements. And so, fusion will subside and the red giant's sun will start to shrink. It will collapse from around 250 times its present size to only about 11 times. The sun will recede back into a size and state more analogous to its appearance during its main sequence. Its reduced surface area will raise the surface temperature to around 4700 Kelvin. At this point, it will be known as a horizontal giant, a stable stage of helium burning within the core, lasting around 100 million years. Once the helium at the core has been more or less used up, the sun will again start to shrink and begin relying on outer layer fuel reserves of hydrogen and helium resulting in a second, much larger expansion event, this time ballooning to over a thousand times its current diameter, around four times larger than what it was during the Red Giant stage. And so, at this point, we can assume that Mars will meet the same fate as the other terrestrials, providing it hasn't already been destroyed or ejected. Once the Sun has swelled to this enormous size, it will again cool down, at which point it will be classed as an asymptotic giant, similar to the red giant stage, but larger, later in its life, less massive and energetic, and far briefer. The asymptotic giant branch lasts only around 30 million years, at which point the sun will begin to undergo a 100,000 year event of mass loss. The outer half of the sun's structure not contained within the core will become unstable, these layers will not explode, but rather will peacefully stream into an emission nebula similar in size to the scale of the solar system's planets, thus known as a planetary nebula. This nebula will contain the helium and carbon fused within the Sun's core, which will contribute to the ever-increasing enrichment of the massive galactic gas clouds from which stars form and in a cyclical process, the Sun's heavier elements will further enrich new generations of more stable, hotter stars, like phoenixes rising from the ashes of the Sun. While this mass loss event will be much more peaceful than a supernova explosion, the streaming away of vast quantities of solar wind will more than likely push away any remaining planets further out. The increasingly fading gravity of the Sun as it loses mass will cause all remaining objects in orbit around it to be bound much less strictly. Whatever remains in the outer solar system will almost certainly spiral off into the darkness of interstellar space, freezing solid to the core in the process and becoming rogue planets. What remains of the Sun at the heart of this nebula will be a small, Earth-sized sphere of extremely dense and compressed degenerate carbon and oxygen matter, known as a white dwarf star, which despite being comparatively small, may be as much as a hundred times more luminous than the Sun when it is revealed. This tiny star will never reach the temperatures or compression required to fuse any of the elements left inside and so it will remain incredibly stable for an incredibly long amount of time. In fact, white dwarf stars will likely be one of the final groups of luminous stars to illuminate the universe in the future. Around 2 billion years after this white dwarf forms, so just over 9 billion years from now, it will have cooled to between 6000 Kelvin and 8000 Kelvin, at which point 90% of the carbon and oxygen within will freeze, causing the Sun to assume a crystalline structure which will take hundreds of trillions of years to go dark. Around one quadrillion years from now, so that's one with 15 zeros after it, the solar system's last day will come. The white dwarf Sun will have cooled to just 5 Kelvin, at which point it will no longer have enough energy to illuminate itself and will become a dark, black body known as a black dwarf. A solid, planet-like sphere of dead matter from which no light or heat is generated. By this time, any remaining planets or objects around the Sun will have been dragged out into interstellar space thanks to the gravity of nearby stars. Nothing will remain in orbit, 
and nothing will ever see a sunrise again. The solar system will have known its last day, a quadrillion years in the future. The final age will draw to a close and the near invisible stellar corpse of the sun will float through what remains of the dying elliptical galaxy it is a part of. Its lost planets now unrecognisable and light years away in the void. Nothing lasts forever in this universe. Not stars, not planets, not galaxies, probably not even space itself. Everything is limited and everything has its day. One day, a long time after the sun dies, the final suns of the universe will meet the same fate. They will become black dwarves and the universe will go dark. Even our own reality seems to have a shelf life, just like us. But the key difference is that we exist much more briefly than any of these events. Our time is much more precious. So the question is, what will you do with the precious time that you have?